welcome to our second session on William Faulkner's Absalom and Absalom. I have mentioned to you in previous meetings that food is an interesting archetypal image in literature, and when anyone writes about food, it attracts you. Food is anything you ingest and then you can eject in terms of energy, the human waste. But anything that you ingest and pour out also is equated with food. Writing is equated with food, where a writer will listen to words, hear words, imagine words, and then he will speak them out on paper. And so, to the extent that food is something palatable, so is writing. To the extent that we like to taste things that are good, we like to read books that are in good taste. And we like to read voraciously, just as sometimes we like to eat voraciously. But also, food and words are related to love. And when people love, they attract each other, and they take each other's warmth together. They take their fluids together, and they exchange and give back what they have received. So food, love, and writing are in parallel structures. And that's why we have to set a table for a few moments as we discuss Absalom and Achitophel. First of all, uh, as we discuss Absalom, Absalom. First we'll set the table, rumple up the napkin, you see. This meal's actually over. And we'll make sure that there is some good whiskey on the table, <laughs> bourbon or wild turkey. Put it in the glass so we, let's see. Just the right raspy taste. A little bit of champagne for after the meal, just in case you want to get fancy. And uh, see, it fizz a bit. I'm not going to mix the two. But sometimes for dessert, what you want is a good lemon sherbet. And that's what we're going to pour out right now into this. That is on a hot summer day, certainly in Mississippi. A good lemon sherbet seems to be something that people would relish eating and enjoying a little bit more. No one wants to just leave the dish half empty, not when you're waiting for something to happen. Now, why, are we, why do we have a rumpled napkin, and a tablecloth, champagne, sherbet, good whiskey for William Faulkner? In chapter 8 of, William, of Absalom, Absalom, page 258 of your text, Faulkner talks about the love affair between Judith and Hen and uh, uh, Charles Bond. And the question is, how do they fall in love? We certainly know that there was manipulation. We know that Charles's mother was very eager to have Charles meet Henry Sutpen, very eager to have Charles go to the University of Mississippi, where Henry Sutpen was to be enrolled. And we know that the lawyer always manipulating this affair, making sure that this very wealthy Spanish woman, actually a Haitian with Negro blood, had great wealth, lived a good life, brought up her son with fine clothes, fine servants, fine horses, fine carriages knew that at some time they were going to insinuate Charles Bunn into the University of Mississippi. 
and within three months after the September semester began, at Christmas time, Charles Bunn would meet Judith Sutpin, and there would begin the series of events that would unfold in a love affair that ended tragically with Charles's death and Judith widowed without being married. How does Faulkner describe the love that grew between Judith and Charles Bunn? Look at the screen for it, please. And here is his description. This is Charles, Shreve describing Charles. He says, and maybe he had even thought about her by that time. Maybe at the times when he would be telling himself, it can't be so. She would be saying, it can't be so. He would not look at me like this every day and make no sign if it were so. So he would even tell himself, she would be easy. That's Judith talking now. And we're switching between Charles and Judith. Like when you have left the champagne on the supper table and are walking toward the whiskey on the sideboard and you happen to pass a cup of lemon sherbet on a tray and you look at the sherbet and tell yourself that would be easy too. Only who wants it? Does that suit you? Now we go back to Quentin and Shreve talking in the Harvard dormitory room. But it's not love, Quentin said. Because why not, says Shreve. Because listen, what was it the old dame, the Aunt Rosa, told you about how there are some things that just have to be whether they are or not? Have to be a damn sight more than some other things that maybe are? And it don't matter a damn whether they are or not. That was it. He just didn't have time yet. Now Charles is growing an attraction to Judith. Jesus, he must have known it would be. Like that lawyer thought. He wasn't a fool. The trouble was he wasn't the kind of not fool the lawyer thought he would be. And so he falls in love with Judith. He must have known it was going to happen. It would be like you pass that sherbet. And maybe you knew you would even reach the sideboard and the whiskey. Yet you knew that tomorrow morning you would want that sherbet. Then you reached the whiskey and you knew you wanted that sherbet now. Maybe you didn't even go to the sideboard. Maybe you even looked back at that champagne on the supper table among the dirty Haviland and the crumpled damask. And all of a sudden you knew you didn't want to go back there even. It would be no question of choosing, having to choose between the champagne or whiskey and the sherbet. But all of a sudden, now you get the romance flourishing. It would be spring then in that country where you had never spent a spring before. And you said North Mississippi is a little harder country than Louisiana with dogwood and violets and the early scentless flowers, but the earth and the night still a little cold and the hard, tight, sticky buds like young girls' nipples on alder and Judas trees and beech and maple and even something young in the cedars like you never saw before. You find, and this is love, the way Faulkner is describing it. And you find that you don't want any, anything but that sherbet. And that you haven't been wanting anything else but that. And you've been wanting that pretty hard for some time. Besides knowing that that sherbet is there for you to take. Not just for anybody to take, but for you to take. 
knowing just from looking at that cup that it would be like a flower, that if any other hand reached for it, it would have thorns on it, but not for your hand. And him, not used to that, since all the other cups that had been willing and easy for him to take up and contain sherbet, but champagne, or at least kitchen wine, and more than that. There was a knowing what he suspected might be so, or not knowing if it was so or not. And who to say if it wasn't maybe the possibility of incest? Because who, without a sister, I don't know about the others, who has been in love and not discovered the vain evanescence of the fleshly encounter? Who has not had to realize that when the brief all is done, you must retreat from both love and pleasure, gather up your own rubbish and refuse, the hats and pants and shoes which you drag through the world, and retreat since the gods condone and practice these, and the dreamy, immeasurable coupling which floats oblivious above the trammeling and harried instant, the was not, is, was, is a perquisite only of balloony and weightless elephants and whales, but maybe if there were sin too, maybe you would not be permitted to escape, uncouple, return. Ain't that right? And of course, in, in this novel, incest appears to be of much less a concern than miscegenation. The mixing of the bloods, Negro and black, is what Thomas Sutpen cannot endure. And that's what he tells his son in that Confederate battlefield, in that tent, when he finally reveals the fact that under no circumstances will he allow Henry, uh, uh, will he allow Charles as he tells Henry, will he allow Charles and Judith to marry? And those become the fateful words before the return to the house. Anthropologists tell us that food is a very, very important image in literature. Write about food and people read. But the food is just a parallel to writing, and writing is an erotic achievement in the hands of William Faulkner, who gives us this brilliant passage and equates the basic mythos of society, man, love, satiation, the failure of satiation, and the tragedy that comes when none of these desires, the desires for the whiskey, the desires for the sherbet, or the desires for the love can be fulfilled. We're going to talk a great deal about William Faulkner's writing, the images he presents, and we have two speakers in this first half of the session who will be talking about chapters 6 and 7 in Absalom, Absalom. Our first presenter will be Robert Quiroz, Mr. Robert Quiroz, who will come up. And as soon as we clear this table, as soon as we give someone else the sherbet, someone else the champagne, a little bit of bourbon, we'll move on to chapter 6. up here. Uh, do my presentation. <laughs> you might want to leave that up here. Uh, 
I have two uh, major goals that I want to accomplish tonight. Other than to communicate uh, what chapter 6 is about. The first is that I run a full half hour. And the second is that I don't bore you to death doing it. Uh, what I'd like to do first, uh, though others have spoken about Faulkner and given you a brief history, uh, some of the timely dates, what I'd like to do is uh, initially to give some of the uh, different things that, about Faulkner that I thought was interesting, snapshots, if you will. Uh, to me, uh, we were talking about Faulkner, the great literary giant, uh, the legend almost, uh, but it's important to me uh, that we look at Faulkner as the man, the human being, and the, the things that that uh, that were unique to him that I think uh, show up in his writing. Uh, he was a short man, about five foot six, uh, but his facial expression, his head, his neck, and his shoulders, especially as he got older, gave him a, an impression of a much greater size. Uh, likewise, his manner of speaking. Uh, his voice was soft and whispery, uh, but had tremendous carrying power, uh, and, and he spoke fast, much faster than I do. Uh, his niece, Dean Faulkner Wells, who he helped raise uh, after his uh, brother, Dean, died, remembers uh, Faulkner as uh, having skin that was weathered, tanned slightly, wrinkled, and he smelled of horses, leather, cedars, and sunshine. I really, I really like that, that phrase. Uh, pipe tobacco and bourbon. And he seemed to belong uh, outdoors. Uh, he was also named after uh, his great-grandfather, William Clark Faulkner, the old colonel, as he was known, uh, who was himself a successful novelist who had written a novel called The White Rose of Memphis. And uh, when I was looking through some of the literature, I was struck by the fact that he was almost a dead ringer for uh, the description of uh, Sutton himself. I mean, the beard, and I mean, he was eerie. So uh, whether that was a conscious uh, attempt by Faulkner or that it had just creeped in, that's not for me to say. Uh, also uh, discovered that uh, he had a, almost a second mother, if you would, uh, the old uh, black retainer, the nanny, uh, that helped him raise him and his uh, siblings named uh, Mammy Carolyn Barr. And uh, they were very close. and. Uh, as he got older, that relationship only deepened and grew stronger and almost went to the point of, of worship on his part. And uh, I mentioned that uh, not only because it's interesting, but I thought it was important that that, that be brought out because of the fact that in uh, Absalom, Absalom and some of his other writings, uh, he can sometimes be seen as writing about uh, blacks uh, in a harsh tone and manner. And uh, clearly he was not a racist or, or uh, had any kind of uh, superiority complex when it came to uh, blacks because, you know, he was very close to someone uh, who was black. Uh, he also enjoyed the company of children. Uh, he enjoyed the spontaneity of the young, and he deeply felt the vulnerability of children. Uh, and I think that, that comes out in Absalom, Absalom, uh, in his descriptions of uh, Rosa as having had really no childhood to speak of, uh, and also of uh, Charles, uh, Charles Etienne Saint-Valéry, uh, the uh, 
the son of Charles Bond and the Octroon mistress. Uh, again, he, that child is described as basically having appeared out of thin air, not having really been born, uh, not really having a child's life, so to, so to speak. Uh, he, he felt people should believe in their progeny. And uh, even uh, Thomas Sutton in, in Absalom, Absalom had a deep, uh, if not a belief in his progeny, at least an intense desire to have progeny, to sustain uh, his plan for his great design for uh, uh, an empire or uh, a dynasty, you know, uh, brought about by his white male heirs. Uh, in fact, uh, there was an incident that struck me that uh, on one New Year's Eve, he uh, invited young people uh, about the same age as his daughter, Jill, uh, da Jill being the second daughter. Uh, he had a younger daughter, Alabama, that died shortly after childbirth. Uh, invited, uh, he invited these young people to Rowan Oak, which was his, uh, his estate. And uh, before a roaring fire, as the chimes of the courthouse sounded midnight, he had served them champagne and, and gave a toast. And yeah, said, "Here's to the younger generation. May you profit." Um, one of the other things that that uh, I was interested in because it seems to come up a lot in the Faulkner myth uh, was uh, his drinking. Uh, from what I could gather, uh, he was not an alcoholic in, in the strictest sense. Uh, his drinking consisted mainly of uh, really horrific binges. And those uh, people that knew him well said that he almost would plan in advance when he was uh, going to have a binge. He would consciously decide, I'm going to get drunk today, and he would. Uh, unlike you know, uh, an alcoholic that needs alcohol every day. Uh, the other thing that, that I found interesting was that when he did go on these binges, they didn't follow failures, as you would think, as a means to kind of uh, get rid of that, that, that pain. Uh, he often went on binges uh, after successes, uh, like uh, the really big binge that he went on shortly after he had been told that he'd won the Nobel Prize. It's a way to celebrate. Uh, the other thing that I liked about him, and I, I think what probably makes him a great novelist, is that he was a fantastic liar. Uh, uh, one of the textbook examples is that in 1918, he tried to join the Army Air Corps, and uh, because he was too small, too short, and too slight, uh, he was rejected. So that didn't deter him. Uh, what he did then was apply to the Canadian Royal Air Force. And to ensure that he would be accepted, uh, he falsified a number of things, including his age, uh, his birthplace. Uh, he added the U to his current spelling to make it look more British. And, uh, and he affected a British accent. Uh, and it worked. I mean, he, he, he got to go to Canada. Uh, started flight training, but uh, but never actually saw combat. Nevertheless, he returned back to Oxford uh, in uh, the, uh, the uniform of uh, of an RAF officer, uh, complete with flying wings, a lieutenant's rank that he had never earned, uh, numerous decorations, and a swagger stick, which I thought was kind of neat. I mean, a swagger stick like. Or like Colonel Clink had in, in Hogan's Heroes, that kind of thing. Uh, he also had uh, used a cane uh, that he used to affect a limp that he claimed that he uh, had gotten from an injury. And he also, in combat, of course, well, to, more to the point, uh, he not only sustained, said he sustained that limp, but he also had gotten a silver plate put in his head as a result of a plane crash. During combat, of course. Now, why a silver plate? I don't know. <laughs> um, 
That, I kind of wondered about that. Maybe that was in vogue then, silver plates instead of stainless steel. Uh, before his writing really took off and, and allowed it and allowed him to support himself in his writing, uh, he held a number of different jobs in Oxford. Uh, he was a carpenter, a uh, painter. Uh, he was also the postmaster at uh, the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss. Uh, but he was an unusual postmaster. And uh, one professor complained that the only way people could get their mail was by digging it out of the trash can by the back door, which I thought was interesting. Uh, the postmaster also delayed delivering magazines until he'd actually had a chance to read them himself. So, my kind of guy. Uh, he often played cards in the back with his friends and often closed early so that they could go play golf. Uh, when he finally was forced to resign under pressure, <laughs> he, he uh, swore that he would never again be at the beck and call of every SOB who's got two cents for the price of a stamp. So, short end to his, his postal career. Uh, he also for a time was the scoutmaster for the local Boy Scouts in Oxford, uh, but was dismissed when a, a preacher complained about his drinking. Uh, so I thought that was interesting too. Uh, some of the other people that I, that I, I thought were uh, influential in his life, other than uh, his wife, I think who has been mentioned already, uh, was Phil Stone, who was a, a friend of his, uh, who was a lawyer, a graduate of the University of Mississippi and of Ole Miss, I mean, uh, and of Yale, excuse me. Uh, he encouraged Faulkner, and he advised him, and he uh, helped him to peddle his manuscripts around to get them published. A uh, very big source of, of help and inspiration to, to Faulkner. Uh, another person was his mother, uh, Miss Maud, who defended him uh, from the various snipes uh, and uh, diatribes uh, of the local people. Uh, she also helped to support him in lean times. Um, an example of, of one of the, the things that was said about him was that uh, he that he actually didn't write the books that he had written, that they were written by some erudite farmer, gentleman farmer, who just preferred not to sign his name to any of those uh, books, and that old Bill Faulkner didn't know the meaning of all those big words. You know, well, count, no count, there's no way. Uh, the other person who, uh, who was a influence uh, was uh, his younger brother, Dean Faulkner, who uh, I think was mentioned uh, died in a plane crash in Faulkner's plane in uh, 1935 at the age of 28. And uh, in, in his grief, uh, William Faulkner moved back in with his mother to help support uh, Dean's uh, widowed wife, Louise. And uh, it was also mentioned that it was during this time of intense grief that he wrote parts of Absalom. Absalom. Uh, he also developed a closer relationship with uh, his niece, uh, Dean Faulkner, uh, named after, obviously, her father, uh, to the point to where they became more uh, like a daughter and father than, uh, than a, uh, a niece and uncle. Now, one of the things that, that really troubled me that I couldn't figure out about William Faulkner uh, was uh, the way that he wrote about the South. The, you know, why, why write all these stories that were really dark and, uh, and really cast the South in a bad light? You know, uh, because probably up until that time, people both in and out of the South uh, held this, uh, this romantic myth of the South had magnolias, uh, mint juleps, 
pull up wild turkey, I guess. Uh, and uh, a slow and easy life where, uh, where basically you could live an idyllic existence. Uh, pop the south of this myth was populated by genteel upper crust people, or those are the ones that you really identified with the south, the old south. Uh, who lived like an aristocracy, uh, that had impeccable manners. Ladies were really ladies, and gentlemen put them on a pedestal and uh, never endangered their honor, much less their personal safety. Well, Faulkner destroyed that pretty much uh, by portraying the Southerners, both rich and poor alike, as not, not as two-dimensional uh, bent people like on oil paintings you know, or on again, like on a myth, uh, but as real people, like the rest of us. Uh, human beings are flawed creatures, and they're capable of great good and beauty, and just as easily capable of, of ugliness and, and terror. And that's, that is just the human condition. And Faulkner portrayed the Southerners like that. He made them real. He made them authentic. And uh, to me, it makes those people more alive and more believable because you, know, you, can, you can believe that they went through some of this stuff. Uh, I think he also allowed the, the South, by forcing them to acknowledge these hard truths about themselves, uh, to address the two most important issues that probably plagued them, and that was uh, the deep poverty that existed during that time, and racism. Um, but they had to get past that notion that they were a genteel uh, culture that, you know, where bad things didn't happen. And uh, I think that's that's the thing that I really take from, from Faulkner. That he, you know, he, he shows people with real problems, with really bad problems, but, uh, but, but problems that they can overcome and endure. Uh, and it makes them uh, better people for that. Now, uh, excuse me, I have this bad habit with my hand. Uh, some of the writing techniques that, that, that he used, uh, being a modernist, and probably being more exper experimental as a modernist than probably anybody that I, that I really can think of, as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, makes for really original, highly creative writing, but as y'all probably know by now, it's incredibly hard to read. Uh, Dr. Rothman had mentioned in the, uh, the class before that uh, his writing was a lot like a cabbage, that you had to peel back layers and layers to, to get to the ultimate truth. Uh, my own take on that is that uh, to me, it's the equivalent of trying to navigate through thick brush at night, a South Texas brush, uh, to try to find your way back. Uh, I mean, it, when I started reading, that's the first thing I thought about. You know, when I had been in the Army, I'd, uh, I'd had to go on one of these compass courses, and uh, I got lost. <laughs> and uh, this reminded me of that. And you know, whether that's just my own quirky connection or not, that's that's what I saw, uh, that's what I compared it to. Now, uh, one of the, the things that, well, the main thing that, that we had mentioned that uh, was the characteristic of his writing was the, the fact that he employed stream of consciousness, where you actually are reading what are supposed to be the, the thoughts uh, of the character that's right at the moment on the forefront. Uh, but he really employs a whole bunch of different things that, that I could see that really makes this probably harder than some of the other books that he's written. Uh, need, needless to say, he uses a greatly enlarged, sophisticated vocabulary. I mean, he just pops those $50 words in, you know, everywhere. And, uh, you know, unless you have a really big vocabulary to begin with, uh, you, you have to wonder, you have to, why did he put that in there? Uh, or you have to stop and look them up in the dictionary. And, and I think, you know, 
the reason he does that, or one of the possible reasons anyway, is that he wants you to slow down the pace of your reading, to not just blow through the, the things that he is trying to present to you. And if he drops something on you that you're not familiar with, well, you have no choice but to either ignore it and possibly lose part of the greater message, or, or you're going to stop and look and see you know, why he picked that word and what kind of relevance it has. Uh, because, uh, especially in light, of, uh, in light of some of the characters, that probably you wouldn't expect them to use some of those words. You know, uh, I don't know. I just don't see some of those people using, oh, well, I'll have to pick out one of those words later on. Um, but I just didn't see them as, do, as uh, normally using those words. Uh, but it does force you into a closer reading and a rereading. Uh, it's almost like sifting through through evidence of a crime to try to find you know, what's really at, at, at hand. Now, one of the other things that I think everybody's already noticed are the really long, continuous sentences that are really just held together by, by semicolons, dashes, and uh, para parenthetical insertions is what I like to call them. And uh, the information in the parentheses a lot of times uh, adds asides, uh, like, oh, by the way, information to what he what is being talked about at that time. Uh, and can be a few words, or they can be a paragraph or a page long, you know, before it drops back into that original uh, thought or subject that matter that was at hand. Uh, it's almost, to me, like a sophisticated word association game, where you you think of one, you pick one word, it reminds you of something else, which reminds you of something else, which reminds you of something else. Uh, it's interesting that the way that that works, and, and again, I think that has a lot to do with uh, uh, the psychological aspect of his writing, the the, the attempt to get into the, into the the mind of a character. Uh, the sentences, when they're like that, you've probably noticed, are really only interrupted by uh, a sudden jolt back to the present. Like uh, when uh, Quentin says yes regularly, when Shreve is, is telling him, well, are you telling me this happened, that the old name did this and this and this, and, and as he goes on after a while, he'll say yes. And, and, and then it goes on again. Uh, and it, it it brings the reader back into the room all of a sudden with Quentin and Shreve. Uh, it's almost like you know, like startling a daydreamer. And then as as soon as that you get that momentary lull, then you're back into that long sentence, that stream of consciousness again. Uh, another uh, item that that I think is important in, in the book is maybe not so much a technique, but a uh, an implement that he uses is the fact that civil war is is present throughout the the book. You know, either in the background uh, or in an immediate scene, where especially where Charles Bond is talking uh, or writing to uh, Judith about what is happening to him and his unit, or uh, or it's alluded to by other characters. Uh, the Civil War is still a real strong memory, or it still is, but especially back then during Faulkner's time. You know, the Civil War, uh, the, the loss itself, the, the devastation that was wreaked upon the, uh, the southern states, and the, their whole uh, way of life that was lost. Uh, and I think that that just inundates uh, the story itself uh, purposely, of course. Uh, especially since he has those connections to the Civil War with his great-grandfather. Um, the novel, I think, is also structured in a way that challenges the way in that novels are traditionally read. Uh, there's a complete disregard, to me, of uh, any kind of chronological order. And uh, you get real abrupt, abrupt shifts from one narrator to another. Uh, and sometimes to an omniscient narrator that 
all of a sudden takes over. Uh, and then you'll go back to one of the characters who, who, will, who will be running you through, through the different uh, sections. Uh, and like Shreve and Quentin, you're presented with evidence uh, in the form of testimonials, uh, first-hand accounts of things, uh, rumors, uh, innuendo, and incomplete information. Uh, and it's scattered through the different chapters, especially, you know, partial facts that were, were Rosa will, will talk about something and then drop it for a while and then pick it up in another chapter. And uh, other times it, it's repeated. And whether that's just to get you back on track and to get those things back into your mind or whether it's to distract you, I'm not sure. But... Uh, it certainly is there, and I think it's 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 not just there randomly. Thank you, Mr. Kiros. I think you're right that the materials in Absalom, Absalom, first of all, seem to be random. They seem to be out of chronological order, and, and in, <coughs> indeed they are, because people are retelling and retelling the story from their own perspective. <coughs> but while you're reading this material, you do have the calendar of events in your work. You have been following events along the way. And so you have an obligation, and the reader has an obligation, to try to put things in order and to try to begin to reorient himself to events as they actually occurred. But in addition to following the chronological events, we also have a, an obligation to try to make sense thematically of some of the events that occur, in fact, all the events that occur in Absalom, Absalom. And if you remember the first night when I did list the chronology, I also suggested that there are concepts in Absalom, Absalom we ought to examine. And these are concepts I introduced in an earlier lecture, which I called and uh, considered the graces. Now, what I want to do for a few moments is look at the concepts under the graces and to try to get some order and some sense out of the thematic entity that we can find, or the entities or the concepts that we can find within Absalom and Absalom. If you remember, the concepts had to do with government, religion, economics, art and aesthetics, science and technology, education, and social behavior. And so for chapter uh, 6, I'd like to look at some of these concepts. First of all, let's look at government. Now, you may not consider some of these concepts the way I consider them, but see if you'll agree with me. Number one, we find that there is a letter from Quentin's father on January 10th, which details Rosa's death the day before on January 9th. The post office, of course, is a government agency, and the exchange of letters means that the government is functioning in this way. Secondly, we discover that Rosa Coldfield's father, remember the man who owned the store, the general store, and who locked himself up in the attic, threw away the hammer after nailing himself in, and starved himself to death. That man made General Lee and Jeff Davis mad. He would not enlist in the Confederate Army. He didn't want to see the South ruin he didn't want to, first of all, see the South ruin itself, and we'll see later that he severely, he strongly objected to the morality of slavery or the immorality of slavery. And finally, we find that Sutpin skulldugged a hundred miles of land out of a poor, ignorant Indian. He had bought the land from this Indian. The Indian apparently didn't know how much he gave up, but government approved it. The government approved the purchase of the land. The government approved the ownership assigned to Thomas Sutpin. 
uh, uh, Sutpen, and, and government, of course, approved the loss of the land by this Indian who really didn't know what was happening to him. And that becomes part of our understanding of government in Absalom. Absalom. We also find out that Thomas Sutpen, with his envision to have a family, to have, a, to have heirs, to have a wife, had to settle for less than regal. And so we get this statement. Ellen Coldfield was a wife, not from one of the local ducal houses, but from the lesser baronage, whose principality was so far decayed that there would be no risk of his wife bringing him for a dowry, delusions of grandeur, before he should be equipped for it. Yet not so far decayed, but that she might keep them both from getting lost among the new knives and forks and spoons that he had bought. So she came from a storekeeper. She didn't come from landed gentry of the South. Sutpin felt that might be satisfactory because she wouldn't put on airs and she wouldn't demand too much of him. But what he did provide, she could take care of. So the distinction between the landed gentry and the middle class store owners becomes a concept of governmental proportion. When Sutpin returns from the Civil War, we find that he returns amidst fields fallow, except for a fine stand of weeds, and taxes and levies, and penalties sowed by United States Marshals. Again, government having to do with taxes, lands, and funds needed to operate their system. We find that Henry Sutpen escapes. We don't know where he escapes to. His son fled to Texas or California or maybe even South America in order to prevent his arrest. And finally, on page 150, we see Thomas Sutpen reliving his war exploits in a drunken stupor. Again, government being the agent and the sponsor of the war effort. We find later on that when Charles Etienne saint valery bon engages in a brawl, he is arrested. And it is only Grandfather Compton's plea that keeps him from jail. Of course, Bon, we know at this point, is depressed, disappointed, disillusioned, because he discovers the reaction against him because of his Negro blood. And it is this realization, this moment of discovery, that has turned him into a brawling alcoholic. Because he is white, and when he tells people he's Negro, and when he's amidst the Negroes, they don't believe him. They feel he's mocking them at points. And so he must fight them and that every effort enters into these brawls. In this case, he is taken out of jail and bond paid for him by Quentin's grandfather, Compson. When Charles Etienne St. Valerie Bond realizes that he is black or that even with his white skin, he engages and is obliged to live amongst the blacks, he then goes out and marries the blackest woman of all, and he comes back to the house with his marriage license and thrusts it in front of the family to indicate that he is married and that he has this woman with him. But she becomes, of course, a center of confusion as people see what they think is a white man with a black woman. And again, this forces him into engagements and into fights. Other examples of government, Judas' $200 headstone for Charles is decreed by Judge Benbow. Judge Benbow administers the estate of Goodyear Coldfield and finds unique ways, such as horse betting, to gain funds or to list funds in order to establish some funding for the estate, which 
has lost its value. Let's move into the field of religion. At some point, you feel there is no religion in Absalom, Absalom. Of course, we have that famous statement by Thomas Sutpin about the South in the Civil War. God forgot us for four years and forgot to tell us. But what concepts of religion do we find in Absalom, Absalom? We have the concept of death, which is not entirely uh, uh, treated by religion. It, of course, can be a moral issue. It can be an ethical issue. It can be a physical issue. But death does become an issue here where Sutpin says, if, where we have Faulkner saying, if death be anything at all beyond a brief and peculiar emotional state of the bereaved, it must be a brief and likewise peculiar state of the subject as well. And if aught can be more painfully to any intelligence above that of a child or an idiot than a slow and gradual confronting with that which over a long period of bewilderment and dread it has been taught to regard as an irrevocable and unpumpable finality. All right, so that we do know that death is an irrevo irrevocable finality, and yet there is, there is catechism we're taught, there are ideas we're taught about death that come out of religion. Of course, the simple expletive, good Lord, yes, let's don't find him or, or it, try to find him or it, risk disturbing him or it. This is when Rosa and Quentin are driving to the house, worried somewhat about finding what it is in the house. Of course, it's Henry who has been hiding there for four years. Then we discover a rather ironic representation of God in Absalom, Absalom, where God is considered a creditor. He sets up the books, and the books represent life or death, good or evil, good fortune or bad fortune. We have 147, and page 147, the statement, the creditor who set his children to destroying one another before he had posterity. Now, of course, at this point, it feels as though it is Sutpin we're talking about. And it is Sutpin, but Sutpin is looked upon by people as being that figure who establishes and destines fate, and therefore there's an equation with Sutpin as God. But that gets less ambiguous. God becomes the creditor, and he is the one who establishes the inexorable and the unknown plan. The demon Sutpin must turn square around and run not only the fiancé out of the house and not only the sound out of the house, but so corrupt, seduce, and mesmerize the son that he, the son, should do the office of the outraged father's pistol hand when fornication threatened. He becomes a moral force, and the creditor Sutpin again becomes the figure of God, destining, uh, predicting, and prescribing the actions that are going to lead to the death of Charles Bond. Again on religion, Rosa claims that Sutpin never had a soul. Of course, he's looked upon as a demon. Whether demons have souls or not, of course, is a theological issue. We find that there is a violation of the basic commandments, the violation of the apodictic laws. When Rosa discovers that Sutpin approached her and suggested that they breed like a couple of dogs together, inventing with fiendish cunning the thing which husbands and fiancés have been trying to invent for 10 million years, coupling fornication and uh, affairs not permitted by the law, not, not permitted by the morality, not permitted by religious code. And so Sutpin is in violation of these religious codes. Of course, at this point, he's not the creditor, He's the demon. 
when, of course, Sutton dies. Judith decides to drive him to church, just as he had earlier driven his blacks to church and engaged in races and engaged in fighting on the church grounds. Judith drives Sutpin and his coffin to the Methodist church, and the wagon turns over. That is fortuitous. But again, religion plays a part when Judith still moves toward the Methodist church. There are tombstones. Tombstones have a religious signification. We put them in religious graveyards to identify those who are dead. We know that Ellen's and Thomas Sutpins were bought in Italy while Sutpin was in the service. He bought the finest Carrara marble. He had it transported through the blockade of Confederate ships by the north. Somehow he got through the blockade. And then he put these tombstones on carts, and his regiment troops had to hold these tombstones throughout the military from north to south until they could be found and returned to Sutpin's Hundred. More about religion and religious attitudes in Absalom, Absalom. Look at this statement. When Charles Etienne Saint Valery Bon and Clyde, the son and the daughter, have to work in the fields, and they work beneath his first father's curse. Now, that, of course, is the curse of Adam and Eve. They had to leave the Garden of Eden and had to labor where they once had peace. So now Charles Etienne is working with Clyde under the first father's curse, but of course working under the second father's curse, who is Thomas Sutpin. And we find, who are they? The two of them, Charles Etienne and Clyde, linked by the savage steel and wood male symbol that is the plow, ripping from the prone, rich female earth, corn, to feed them both. And so again, religion has to do with the labor attended, required of male and female in the world as a consequence of the sin of the Garden of Eden. And here you have, uh, again, religious elements, religious concepts in Absalom, Absalom. A fourth tombstone is purchased by Judith with a hundred dollars in nickels and dimes for Henry. And the fifth tombstone is Judith's, set away from the others because she died of yellow fever. Uh, this was a point of debate in Faulkner. Yellow fever was not a fatal disease. Smallpox was, but uh, Faulkner, for his own reasons, had her die of yellow fever. What is the nature of life? This, of course, is a religious issue, a teleological issue. And we find that Judith Colton Sutpin, this was her epitaph, daughter of Ellen Coldfield, born October 3rd, 1841, suffered the indignities and travails of this world for 42 years, four months, nine days, and went to rest at last, February 12, 1884. Pause, mortal. Remember vanity and follow and beware. So life does have a terminus, and Rosa and Judith Coldfield here has a terminus. Widowed before she was married, learning of her husband's death or her fiancé's death while she holds her wedding gown in her hand, forever then in poverty and misery after the death of her father, suffering the indignities and travails of this world. This is a woman who must suffer the travails and tribulations of Womankind, mankind, 
in this veil of tears. Again, a biblical concept. But notice, and I'm going to talk later on about Faulkner's speech to the Nobel Prize Committee. Faulkner finds that these women are indomitable. His women are strong. They still try to strive, and even Sutpin, even after the first failure of his family in Haiti, even after the second failure of his family before the gates of Sutpin's hundred, he tries to start a third family. He and the women, says Faulkner, are the indomitable spirit of the work. He says these Sutpin women have a courage and fortitude in the face of pain and annihilation which would make the most Spartan man resemble a puling boy. Yet their funerals and graves, the little puny affirmations of spurious immortality, are of incalculable importance. We have the quote from Absalom, Absalom. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not. And we have this idea. Suffer little children, for them, for, forbid them not to come unto me. And this is Sutpin's idea. Suffer little children, forbid them not, let them come unto me, for this is the kingdom of heaven, and this is Sutpin's goal, this is Sutpin's desire, this is Sutpin's commitment to life and to posterity. This chapter is Sutpin's chapter as he describes what he wants to do and the kinds of women will, who, who will help him breed children, little children. We'll move on to some others. Of course, we have the economic problem. Judith has no money. She's starving. She's in poverty, yet she hires Negro boys to do her yard. They do it at this odd woman's request, knowing that Judge Benbro will pay them. Sutpin came back after the Civil War, and in the field of economics, he feels he can recover. The demon believed he could restore by sheer indomitable willing the Sutpins hundred, which he remembered and had lost, labored with no hope of pay or reward. And we see the poverty of Judith Coldfield. People put charity baskets on her front porch. And when they put these baskets on her front porch, what do they discover? She takes the baskets in the house. She eats them. But she doesn't wash the dishes. She doesn't wash the silver. She puts it back as though she hadn't touched it, as though she has no obligation. And their obligation uh, is to provide whatever she is willing to take. But she has no return. Her pride prevents her from admitting her poverty. In other fields, art and aesthetics, Quentin contemplates, contemplates death like Hamlet. And we have the Sutpin allegory. This Faustus, this Beelzebub fled. And so Faulkner uses in his art knowledge of the aesthetics of writers of the past and the myths that they have provided him in the Hamlet, in the Faustus, in the Guinevere, in the Agamemnon and the Cassandra, in the Pyramus and Thisbe, he recalls the art of other writers. He recalls the myths of the past. This becomes an aesthetic reformulation of the elusive capability of Faulkner to infuse his characters with properties and characterizations that will give the reader new impressions of their strength, their power, and their endurance over the years. We 
we know, of course, that Faulkner talks about the fates. The three women who rolled their own garments, Clyde, Judith, Rosa. We'll talk about them later. Thank you.